Hello and welcome to episode 33 of the Rivercats 9 Lives podcast. Our guest this week is Rivercats pitching coach Garvin Alston. Garvin Alston, G, uh, uh, great to have you with us. Uh, tell me what's going on in your, in your off season. The, the pitching coach, the Rivercats, by the way, Garvin Alston. Uh, G, what's going on? Johnny D, it's good to be with you. No, not 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 a whole lot, man. Just uh, hanging out with family and um, enjoying some uh, downtime and relaxation. So uh, overall, everything is going really good. Um, just relaxing and start next week. I'll, I'll get back to the facility and help out with all the uh, players that are starting to show up. Yeah, I know. And I'll tell you, you look at 2023 and it's upon us. It goes so quickly with the season, the minor league season ending in late September. Uh, not a lot of time between the end of the season before February, you get ready for, for spring training. And I know there's some you know exciting things coming up uh, for the River Cats in 2023. And we'll start, you know, look, everybody wants to know about Kyle Harrison. He's going to start the year. Bar on, so he's going to start in AAA. I know you've, uh, you've dealt with him a little bit and you've seen him pitch. What, what can you tell us about, about Kyle? Oh, Kyle Harrison. I've seen him pitch, been around him um, from the day that he's entered our organization um, the first thing I will say about him is he he knows who he is. And that is like one of the biggest things for a young man to come in and uh, be the person that he was and know exactly who he was and what he wants to do and how he wants to do it. That was kind of impressive to see. Um, and this was two years ago when I saw it. Um, so the one thing I can say about him, you're going to get a competitor. This dude competes all day, every day on the mound. Everybody knows about all the things he can do on the field as a pitcher uh, with his repertoire, fastball, breaking ball, and changeup. Uh, he competes, and um, I- I'm looking very forward to just getting to know him better and seeing what he can do. Well, gee, you know, one pitcher that took such a step forward in 2022 uh, was Sean Jelly. And you remember, well, you and I talked about him in 2021, and, you know, he there were times he let his emotions get the best of him with umpires. Yeah. Uh I saw a different Sean Jelly. I saw a more mature Sean Jelly. I saw a Jelly that didn't react. Uh, his stuff obviously plays, and he went to the big leagues and competed and did well. Uh, you know, had his moments in the big leagues, which is going to happen as as a young pitcher. But then he he was uh, he was he had some solid appearances and starts. Uh, what did you see from Sean in 2022 that you maybe didn't see in in 2021? I think you said it perfectly. Um, the maturity aspect of it, right? Um, just going into from coming in from double A to the big leagues and in 2021, you know, he's excited, was out there and didn't understand the league itself. And I think more or less what it was, is he didn't understand him and what he needed to do as far as six, being a success story for the major leagues. And just having that small bit of time in 21, I think prepped him better for 2022. And when he came in, I mean, got off to such a hot start, but it was because he was in control of his emotions. It was in control of his delivery and he was more understanding of what he can and can't do. I think that's the biggest thing that I try to help pitchers with when they get there is to find out who are you? Like you, you, sometimes you'll go through an organization and you'll dominate just because of stuff, but you're going to get to a point where the, the talent level matches each other. And when that happens, you got to know who you are. And if you don't know who you are and what you can do and what you can't do, you end up making the same mistakes. And um, for him, I thought he did a great job of understanding during the offseason, his prep, our conversations during the offseason. Um, he's, he's, I won't say he's a favorite, but I love the kid because I see what he wants and how he wants it. And he's not afraid to go ahead and speak his mind. And I enjoy that from young people. I know you do. And, you know, look, you guys have had conversations and and sometimes they get intense and, you know, uh, you know, guys, when guys go up and down like that. And he's a guy right now in baseball, you have guys that are up and down guys, you know, Blevins did it, but a lot of guys who have success in the big leagues that are up and down guys at some point in their career. And it's hard. It's not easy. Yeah. Obviously they want to be in the big leagues and they go down to triple a a bunch of times. How do you manage that? Not only with jelly, but with other, other pitchers, uh, that kind of roller coaster up and down the emotions of it. How do you, what do you, how do you deal with that? Well, it's a couple of ways of dealing with it. For me, I think relationship building is like the most important to be able to understand who they are and they can understand who I am and building relationships. So once that is established, I think being a 
being a person that can just listen and hear them out and get whatever they're feeling off their chest, good, bad, or indifferent, and being able to go ahead and not question it, right? Um, it's okay to be upset. Uh, I want you to be upset. I mean, you're coming from the best place that you want to be, which is the major leagues back down at AAA. And so if you're happy about that, then I got more questions than anything else. So for me, hearing you being upset or hearing, you know, you need to do things better and then having that plan to put together so we can talk about it and figure out what we can do to get you back up there, but not just get up there, but stay up there and contribute up there. That is the the number one thing that I try and do. So to answer your question, try to be a good listener more than anything else. You know, I think one of your one of the most rewarding things for you and all pitching coaches and managers and coaches in general is watching the improvement and watching a guy who may struggle his first four or five starts and then finally something clicks and what you guys have worked on it, it works and, and they apply it. And then I talk about Tristan Beck because, you know, remember his first four or five starts where he was he was struggling for him to, you know, kind of be patient. And I think you taught him some patience. Uh but I think he learned a lot about himself uh, in 2022. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I, I think Tristan did a phenomenal job of two things. One, having unbelievable energy coming up and um, from, from AA. And in doing so, again, um, I, I see this trend majority of the time when they come up. There's a period of time of transition and understanding where you're coming from, the teams that you face, the players that you face, the fields that you pitch at, compared to being in the PCL. The PCL is relentless. And it's it's a place where if you don't understand how to pitch and know what you're doing with your repertoire, what ends up happening is that you become, things speed up on you pretty much, right? So for Tristan, it wasn't that he was throwing the ball bad or poorly. He was just getting in situations, being behind in counts, um, not landing pitches where he wanted to, um, dealing with the new system, uh, ABS system, understanding AAA hitters, uh, which are major league hitters, and then deal with altitude. So when you factor in all these pieces of the pie and puzzle together and you sit there, the one thing I will say about Tristan is he started to figure out, okay, I need, I need help. And in order for him to do that, I had to let him go. Like the failures that happened with him, those are just learning lessons. And that's yeah. okay. And yeah. it's going to be that way when he goes to the next level. There's going to be some times when he fails. But now he understands the process of if I fail, I know that I can be successful if we have dialogue. If I take a look at exactly and honestly take a look at what you're doing and how you're doing it in order to get ahead and and have some success at that next level. Yeah, look, he has put himself on the map. I mean, this guy, you know, the Giants are talking about him. And I, I tell you, he's a guy that, I mean, you know, when you, when you talk about future Giants, he's in yeah. that conversation, right? Absolutely. No, don't question about it. I mean, Tristan brings a lot to the table. One, um, he's a guy that never wants to come out the game, which you love. Um, two, he has a fastball anywhere from 92 to 97. He can throttle a fastball anytime he wants to at the top rail. He has two breaking balls that he can throw for strikes uh, when his command is locked in. And he has a changeup that was developed from the time that he was here in from the time in double A to the time that he's here now, where he was able to throw that pitch as a soft contact and even some swing and misses, especially the lefties, but it wasn't just the lefties. So I think now it's just more or less of him understanding his pitch mix and when to use it, understanding the handiness of people that he's facing and, and what to do with it. And I thought definitely by mid-July, late July, he figured it out. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he had a very successful season. Yes, he did. You look, we're going to talk about some other pitchers, but I want to talk about a, a non-pitcher <laughs> that I know you uh, you like to talk about, and you, <laughs> Joey Bart. I know you talk about Joey Bart. That's your guy. Uh, it is. Can you uh, tell the folks a little bit about kind of – your relationship with Joey and just watching him through the years and, and where he is right now and where he was. Gosh, um, Joey Bard, someone that I truly care about, not just as a ball player, but as a person. Um, the one thing that I would say about Joey that stands out to me that kind of opened up my heart to him more than anything else 
was how he worked, right? I mean, a lot of people don't realize there's an immense amount of pressure on a young man who is extremely talented. Uh, we know that he can hit. We know that he can catch. He has a cannon for an arm. Um, he learned how to call games better as he went along. But then when you put on top of that, being a first-round draft, um, draft pick, and then have to follow a Hall of Famer. Yeah. Like, I don't think people truly get what that means. Now, with that all being said, he's handled it extremely well. And everybody's expected him to step in and be the exact same as, as Posey. For me, they're two different hitters. They're right. two different um, game calls. They're two different people. So for me, just watching how he grinded every single day, he was in the office, he was talking, he was trying to get better. He was trying to get pitchers better. He was trying to win games. He is one of the biggest guys that I know when it comes to, I want to win the game. Like, let's go win the game. And, and understand that the processes that we came up with for him to understand how to get to that point is why I think that the success that he had calling games and blocking and doing all that stuff, uh, it, it came to fruition just because he was able to get ahead and put in that work. A lot of people don't see that on the backside. And uh, he does all the intangibles to do that. Also, G, you know, when he came back, I remember seeing him in Salt Lake City right before at the Salt Lake City, the Sheraton, that Starbucks. And we talked a little bit. There was a uh, that was when he went down. And right before yeah. he was getting I think he was just about I mean, I think that day he was called up. There was a piece to him. I, I think coming down to AAA for whatever it was, a week or so or a week and a half, two weeks, just helped him take a deep breath. Yeah, kind of soak it all in, and he went back up and he raked. He went to, to the big leagues and he raked. I, that those two weeks, yeah, such a difference for him. Oh, I I, I believe it, and, and the reason why I say I believe it is because at some point in time, regardless if you're a veteran or if you're a rookie, just taking a chance to or taking a time to breathe and go. When you get that. It's, it's almost like a reset, right? Mm -hmm. And I think our organization did a phenomenal job of recognizing that and giving him that opportunity to do that, um, to shore up some things. I know he was going through a swing change and things of that nature. And, you know, it's difficult to get ahead and change things while you're in competition mode. So that, that little bit of a break to have him come down and work on the things he needed to work on with Tiny, uh, Damon Minor, and put those things in perspective, I think allowed him to say, oh, okay, now we can go. And I think the best is yet to come for him. You know, we talk about Cole Waits, and it's funny, I talked to Justin Lear about it, and you, and you guys both had the same reaction to Cole Waits. You liked the fact that he would challenge you guys. He would he would yeah. ask questions. He would not just accept everything you said. He said, well, how is that going to work for me? And there, there was a... Uh, a curiousness to him uh, with, with the way he, and he, obviously this stuff plays obviously, but right. can you talk about uh, his ability to kind of grasp uh, himself and understand challenging himself and challenging you guys a little bit? Absolutely. No, the one thing that uh, with Cole, when he got here, you know, he was such, he was on a, a hot streak, you would say all year. Um, so because of that, when he came in, it was more or less, let's see what he's got and see what's going on. Let's stay with the uh, routines that he has and the processes. But you're right. Um, he does challenge, you know, different thoughts, different ideas and, and different things that you present to him, which is what you want. You want someone that's not going to just say, OK, coach, whatever you say. We don't want that. We want a, a dialogue between player and staff. And in doing so, the one thing I think he he owns it. He's accountable to everything he's doing because it's not just something that is given to him. Information is given to him. He dissects it the way he needs to. Um, the one thing that I would say with him is that he cares more about how his body's moving, mm -hmm. like his body moving, moving in a proper direction and everything else take care of itself. And that's the main thing for him is to make sure that he's moving well. He's understanding how his, uh, his front lead leg is happening. Um, he's staying through the baseball. He has one of the purest fastballs in baseball. It's it's rare when you have someone that throw a, a fastball at his velocity, but as true that he does. Mm -hmm. Now, look, there, there, there's a guy, a left-hander that made some history last year. Uh, and uh, I just, I hope 
he gets his chance in 2023. He pitched so well. And, you know, look, there, he, through the first half of the season, he had a one and a half in the Pacific Coast League, okay? Ended up with yep. a four, which is, you know, look, it, with the Coast League, that's like a, a two and a half. Um, Joey Marciano was, was very special this year, and he, he took pride in the fact that he made history, all-time appearance leader in, in the season, uh, River, made some Rivercats history with 55 appearances, 56 appearances. Uh, what does Joey need to do uh, to, to get to get that shot? Um because I look, he's a guy I think that can compete. Obviously, he can he can pitch up there. It's just yeah. getting his chance. Yeah, I think it's opportunity, right? Uh, opportunity for him to go out there, pitch, um, be successful, uh, and not just in making pitches. Right? There's there's more to pitching than just throwing the ball over the plate with a nasty ninety seven miles per hour fastball and a eighty four to eighty five mile an hour slider. Um, the things that I think he needs to just shore up on is, you know, understanding how to hold runners, um, game management, um, those small things. And I, I go back to last year when um, we had a, a couple of guys that was throwing a ball extremely well and uh, they didn't get their opportunities. And, you know, that's just the way it went. I mean, with 100 win season, guys were rolling and clicking and everything else. But what ended up happening was this past year, they would count upon and call, and the person I'm speaking about is Marte. Yeah. Marte, like, yeah, in 21, was, you know, one of our best pitchers that's out there, but, you know, wasn't didn't have the opportunity to do what he needs to do. And then the next year he was called upon. So for me, I kind of look at it at the same light of Marcy is extremely close, and if needed, he can go up there and help any team um, to go up there and help them, you know, win ball games and be a vital part of a bullpen. But there's some things that he still does need to work on. I think he will. And I know we talked about it during the season, and he understands the things he needs to shore up, uh, whether it's um, dealing with first pitch strikes and kill shots he was amazing at, total strikes, holding runners, whatever it might be. Yeah, He's going to put in the work to do it. So those are the things that I'm actually very excited to see for spring training because he is a person that if you give him you know, real information to work on, he's going to work on it and get better. And I think yeah. his time will come. Love to hear that. And that's a great, great comparison with, with Marte needing an extra year. And obviously, the, let's be honest, the 2020 pandemic didn't help. It put guys back back a year. And we'll talk about it at some point with uh, with Ramos. Now, now, as far as Marte goes, Marte established himself a little bit. Doval is what I want to talk about. Because that, that, was, that was a source of pride for you. You know, remember when he was throwing that slider, had trouble locating it, and then now he's one of the top five closers in the National League, uh, maybe the game. Uh, yeah. He is just a treat to watch with the Giants right now. Oh, he is. And um, there was a lot of work done in 21 uh, to help him get to the point where he's at. He did everything that we asked him to. Um, there was a little bit of pushback occasionally from time to time and not understanding why we were doing the things that we were doing. Um, but we everybody sees the talent. The talent is elite. It's a, he's a unicorn when it comes to where he throws the ball from with the velocity and movement patterns that he has. So just to try to unlock that and him getting the reps, not just in AAA, but also in the major leagues and having some failure, I think that helps with guys coming into their own. You know, a couple of things that we presented to him uh, in 21 was, you know, we know you can get guys out here in AAA with your fastball. Yeah. Let's go ahead and let's start using a slider and let's basically get your game plan in AAA. But when you go up to the major leagues, it's not something new to you. Right. And in doing so, uh, I'll give you a quick story. So um, we we're playing in SAC. Uh, it was later in the season before he got called up for the last time. And the game before he absolutely dominated with fastballs. So myself and um, well, we talked to him um Oh, God, I just, um, uh, Duvall, we sat yeah. down and we talked. I said, hey, bro, we need to throw more breaking balls. Well, two days later, he goes out there and he throws 11 straight sliders. I'm waiting for him at the top step as he comes down. Actually, it was 14 straight sliders. <laughs> and um, I stood there and I watched him. And as he walked down, I literally took my clipboard and I threw it. And he walked down and he goes, Poppy, what's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so I laugh and I go, really? And Trompy was our catcher at that time. Yeah, yeah. And so Trompy was translating back and forth. 
And Trumpy basically tells me, said, well, you wanted more sliders. He wanted to give me more sliders. And I was like, okay, <laughs> we're not playing this game. So yeah. after the game, we sat down, myself, Cabrera, him, and I said, look, you can do it this way. It's perfectly fine. But what we're trying to do is make you see how good your slider is and to prep yourself for the major leagues to be a, a person that can get ahead and contribute and contribute at a high level. And ever since that day, he under, started to understand his mix of, of using his sliders, especially to left-handers, because that was his main thing to get ahead and um, try to get left-handers out. And on top of that, I had introduced to him throwing the two-seamer, which wasn't used in 21, but became one of his biggest pitches that yes. he threw in 2022. He was throwing that two seamer at 100, 101 miles an hour. It was crazy. It, it, it just, and that that was, I mean, to have that third weapon, incredible. I mean, it, you know, the two seamer, the four seamer, got that slider. It's like that's that's elite, right? You throw it that is. for strikes, it's elite. It is, and it started off as you know throwing the two seamer was just trying to keep his slider intact more than anything else to keep everything even. When you start throwing too many sliders, you become a little bit more supernated, um, biased. And so in doing so, it was like, okay, let's go ahead and throw two seamers and catch play just to kind of keep you in a good range of where you release the baseball. And then just watching it and getting off the mound, it was absolutely amazing to see his two seamer at work. And I was like, wow, this is a uh, a pitch that he can possibly use. And he actually did throw a couple in 2021 during the season, but uh, that got nixed quickly. Hey, G, uh Real quick, put some pressure on you here. Uh, the ABS, automatic ball strikes, do you like it? What do you think of it? I know we've had some – it's not perfect. We had that pitch from Jelly that was low and away that they called a strike <laughs> that hit that corner. Yeah. Jelly was like, what? Uh, <laughs> what, do, what do you think of ABS overall? Do you think it's coming to the big leagues? What, what, is, your, what, is, what is your feeling on it? 100% is going to be in the major leagues. 100% is going to happen. Yeah. Um, I do feel this uh, upcoming year in 23 – so I think I just read that all AAA teams will um, be using the ABS system one form or the other um, this upcoming year. So that is basically in preparation uh, for the, the major leagues. Mm -hmm. um, that's one. The question is, do I like it? Yeah. It's not that I don't like it. I just don't think it's necessary. Um, and the reason why I say that is if we're, if, if we're out there as human beings going out there and playing a game and there's some human error on both sides, on the pitching side and the hitting side. Now we're eliminating another aspect of that on the umpiring side of calling balls and strike. Um, it's going to change the game. It already did for us this past year when we used it on how guys use their pitches. And the example of that is for those that pitch at the top end of the zone. Um, the, a lot of those guys that we hear that didn't have the velocity but had the spin rate and the carry on their fastballs was hurt just because they didn't know exactly where the top of the zone was. Right. And it changes from hitter to hitter because that's what ABS is. Every hitter that comes in has a different zone. So the consistency of being able to throw your fastball at the top part of the zone is it's not a stable thing. Mm -hmm. It's constantly moving on you. So because of that, that's where I feel the those margins become a little bit more skewed towards the hitting side or to the not even the hitting side to the ball side. And if hitters can show more restraint and play discipline, you're going to see walks go way up. Hey, how about the shift uh, in the big leagues? Uh, they're, they're, I don't and I don't think they're I don't even think they're doing it, AAA as far as the shift. The shift is going to happen. They're going to ban the shift in uh, in 2023 in the major leagues. What do you think of that? Oh, I'm perfectly fine with it. Um, for me, it, it didn't matter um, whether the, the ship was on or, or not on or anything else. For me, it was more or less the execution of the pitch, right? If you mm -hmm. make a good pitch and, and Jelly got burned by this so much, where he'll throw a really good two-seamer, guys are late, and we're in a shift mode where our third baseman is not hugging the line but covering third base side, shortstop is playing more in a – a four position, and then our second baseman is playing on the other side. These soft hit ground balls going through the second base area, we're getting through. So it's going to help in that regards, but it's also going to take away from when balls are hit up the middle a little bit and we have our shortstop played on the pole side, those balls are going to get through. So for me, 
it, it, it doesn't make any difference. We still have to execute pitches when it comes down to it. Gee, you know, it, it, it's funny. You, you have such a good relationship with your pitchers. Uh, you, you, uh, you get very close with them. You know them personally. You know, you know not only about the professional lives, but you talk about life in general with them. And that's how it's always been with you as a coach. Um, you know, as, as you went through your career as a player, you know, yeah. at uh, Mount Vernon and, uh, and then Mercy. And then I mean, go through it. You had played in the Cape Cod league and then you, you, yeah. you got, you got drafted. You um, 10th round pick got to the biddies in 96. During all that time, did you think you would be coaching and having those, you've always had those relationships. Did you think you'd be a pitching coach or a coach in general when you were coming through as a, as a pitcher? Absolutely not. Really? Absolutely. 1000% not. Um, I, of course, as everyone else envisioned myself having a 10 plus big league year um, career um, that didn't happen through injury and not being successful. Um, so once that was done, I was very content working here in Arizona with a job. And although it didn't pay a lot, it paid enough. And I was home with my family. Like, I was perfectly fine. It wasn't until I ran into um, Billy Owens, who's with the uh, Oakland Athletics. Well, and man. um, we sat and we talked for maybe four minutes, five minutes. And he said, I'm going to have someone give you a call because we have an opening. And I think you should, you know, try and become a pitching coach. And has chance have it, the person that I was sitting and talking with, Ron Romanic, who was my pitching coordinator for many years matter of fact he was a pitching coordinator for the Mets he he's the one that that got the the Groms and that whole group together when he was over with the Mets as pitching coordinator he got those guys going and along with the guys with the Oakland Athletics which is Hudson Zito uh, he was the the man behind the scenes that kind of got those guys going so he was my mentor and uh during this interview um he sat down at a uh a local restaurant. Uh, I won't share that name, but uh, okay. we sat down and ordered no food. And we sat and we talked for literally about three and a half, four hours. Wow. And at that time, I was doing a side gig of working with Inside Edge. And Inside Edge was a, a up and coming uh, company that was scouting and helping with um, pitch location and, and things of that nature of uh, baseball clubs mm -hmm. so I had a background at that time of understanding about pitches locations where they're at and everything else I used to sit in my house for hours and re-watch um, games that would play the Diamondbacks Colorado Rockies San Francisco Giants um, Texas Rangers all those different teams and I would watch these pitchers just pitch and locations so that's kind of where my love for um, anal analytics came from from working with Inside Edge way back in the day in 2000, 2001, 2003, those years. Um, but staying with the story, um, once I finished uh, that interview, I kind of came home and talked to my wife about it. And the support of what Natasha had said was, you know, go do what makes you happy. And I knew baseball made me happy. I knew I loved it. Um, but bigger than that, I, I believe that my purpose is to show young men, you know, the right way and, and help them and in, in, in trying to channel their things in their lives uh, and just being an ear to to hear and listen and, and be in their form. You know, I received so many phone calls at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning just to talk about things that they're going through, whether it's, you know, them not being successful in the field or them going through things at home with, um, you know, fiancés and, and things of that nature. Yeah. So I think that's, part of my purpose uh, in life uh, is to, to to be that and be a part of that. I love that. Well put. Now we have about three minutes here. I want to talk about Jayla. I want to talk about Junior uh, real quick, because uh, I know you're proud of both of them. Uh, Jayla is uh, doing great things in college and she's making shorts and uh, it, it's incredible making short films. And, and you, you were uh, you were a part of one of them. You, you, you're an actor too. Crazy. I was. It. I just finished uh, seeing her not too long ago, literally less than 10 days ago. And um, I was part of a short that they were putting together. And I was the guy at the uh, at the grocery store at the stand. So it was it, I can't wait for it to come out. 
and see what it looked like. I was so uncomfortable. That is not my area. So uh, that was fun. And Junior, Junior's doing fine. Um, he's working his butt off. He actually, this offseason, well, last offseason, this offseason, um, he works at Mountain Point High School. And he works with um, children that has um, disabilities. And uh, so he's, that's, he has one of the biggest hearts that I know. Um, so him going back to the school and working with kids with uh, disabilities and being there for them, um, I, I'm more proud of that than the success that he has on on the baseball field and, and getting to double A with the uh, Washington Nationals this past yeah. year. It's it look you when I asked you about it, you're like, look, I don't really coach him. Like I let them nope. I let let the coaches he have coach him. I, but I, we talk about life and talk about that. You don't really give him a lot of advice, like. Look, you give him parental advice. He's your yeah. son, but you don't. But you don't talk about the the mechanics and the fundamentals, really, because that's their job, right? It is. It is, and I do my best. And um, recently, we've actually been doing a little bit more of that. But prior to coming up through high school and college at ASU and University of South Carolina Aiken, um, I kind of allowed him to do his thing. I, I wanted him to either succeed or fail in the things that he was doing, and it wasn't something that was. I was told to him. Now, if he was asked, I'll give him any advice that I do have and and share that with them, which I did last year in understanding what's his best pitch and what's not his best pitch, when to use it, where to use it, and those things, whatever, just to kind of give him a guide. And he just took it and ran with it and had a an extremely successful season this past year. How cool was that when he faced Bo Brundage? You and Brundy, how great is that? I mean, that, that's just amazing. Brundy's such a great guy. You, you like the yeah. fact that you guys talked about it and he uh, and he faced each other. How cool is that? It was cool. Like honestly, I didn't know what he was talking about when he first said it. Yeah, and I was still at the field doing some work, and then doing so, I was like, oh my goodness, they faced each other. Yeah, and then and I told G about it. He was like, oh, that's pretty cool, and I was like. Yeah, it is pretty damn cool. <laughs> it's amazing. Hey, G, thanks for taking the time. We we run out of time, but we'll, there's so much more to talk about, and we'll have you on again soon. But always great to catch up. I miss seeing you on a daily basis, and I'll yeah. see you uh, see you soon. Won't be long. It won't be long, Johnny D. I love you, man. I appreciate you always. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Rivercats Nine Lives podcast, hosted by Johnny Dosco. Please like, subscribe, and share with all your baseball-loving friends. And make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook. 